So, I kind of wanted to chat about FUD. What is FUD? Uh, well, FUD is uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Now, you may think of FUD uh, in a purely marketing context. Um, it comes from a much, let's say, longer... Uh, it has a greater history than just sales or marketing. It is actually, at the beginning, a human concept. But before I get into that, um, I kind of want to go into some, let's say, some prime examples of, uh, well, not fuddish behavior, but uh, things that, you know, we could consider to be fun. So, um, let's say uh, you as an individual learn to drive. Driving is one of the most stressful things in the universe. At least to me it is. Uh, same thing as spiders. Well, if you were to tell me that tomorrow I had a uh, driving exam, which please don't, um, first of all, I would be very doubtful of that that's something else, but I would be afraid for myself, for other people, um, especially for other people, because, well, cars are designed to be safe, right? Uh, crash them at low velocity, you'll be fine. Hit a baby, you'll be less fine. The baby too, but, you know, let's not talk about sad things. Um, another thing is, well, you know, it's a little bit complicated. You could instill, let's say that I actually knew how to drive, and I had my exam tomorrow. You could instill a lot of, um, you know, uncertainty. Uh, do I actually have my driving exam tomorrow? Maybe. Um, is it actually at that place where people go and get a driving exam? Maybe. And you could just bombard me with these kinds of questions over and over, until I'd feel uncertain enough that I'd have to check, and check again, and check again, and kind of spiral into a, well, less than agreeable, uh, vicious circle of me questioning my sanity. And then there is doubt. Would I actually be able to succeed? Am I going to be successful in not killing anyone? Um, in Switzerland, there's this fun thing that's called courtesy points when, uh, when you're doing a driving exam. And are you going to be put into a situation where this... where you actually need to, you know, wave someone, say hi, wave someone across the road, be courteous to someone... And uh, you, you start with a disadvantage. And you have all this kind of, um, let's say, not vicious circle, but train of thought that brings you down. Now, I started this on a very personal perspective. That's a little bit weird, right? When the title of this was um, FUD and Cybersecurity. Now, this is a challenge slide deck. Let's put it that way. Thank you, James. Um, in the sense that there's seven slides. But there's a lot of things I kind of want to talk about. There's also a lot of things where I want to get your input. Because, let's be honest, we all, more or less, and I'm saying less for myself, um, work in cybersecurity, right? Uh... And we all see in the, well, in our daily lives, things that make us question ourselves, question people that give us orders. Or if you're James, question yourselves again. Um, and it's a bit of a complex uh, topic. So do feel free to chime in with any type of comment, question, or anything to get the conversation going. Um, 
the first thing um, is that FUD isn't something that's purely sales. That's not exactly a myth. Sales does employ FUD tactics, a lot of them, but the originators of, you know, FUD as a, you know, as a, um, not topic, but as a concept is actually as far related from sales and as closely related to sales, notice the dichotomy, as possible. And this is where the first slightly contentious point comes in. It's not contentious in the, in the fact that it is recorded fact, it is contentious in terms of the origins and how they relate to what I just said. The first noted term of FUD was in 1693, so before we had predatory sales tactics, before we had uh, people telling us that the previous version of the CPU couldn't handle the modern workload, um, before anything re remotely related to cybersecurity was even a, a figment uh, of an idea in, you know, in the head of anyone. Mostly because there was no cyber, no computers, no, not even electricity in 1693, I think. Uh, so, yeah, that sentence wasn't exactly FUD. It was doubts, fears, and uncertainties, which you may say is actually the same thing, just in a different order. And where did this come from? It came from a book written by William Payne called A Practical Discourse of Repentance. Practical Discourse of Repentance is a very religious book. Uh, going about, if you read it, it's available for free on Google Books. I perused it a bit. Um, that goes into showing the virtuosity of the repentant man uh, when it comes to everyday life, that they should be repentant, that they should be as virtuous as possible in order to uh, gain salvation. That's original context. And you, you might argue this is sales. At the time, you know, there, there were a lot of things that happened where potentially churches would ask people for their lunch money, um... Not exactly much money, but you get my point. And in order to gain access to heaven. Now, this was Middle Ages, but it also did exist uh, in, you know, in the 17th century. A little bit later, 1920, so it's slightly closer to us, right? In another religious book, or more accurately, a collection of religious letters, more, more accurately... Uh, in Georgia, the a collection of letters between someone involved in a Catholic community and someone that was resolutely not involved were conversing by way of letter. And this is the first, at least, noticed appearance of the order of those words, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Uh, so some individual named Farrell wrote that suspicion of Catholics had no place in the exchanges between the two individuals, that it was used as a shield for ignorance and as a sign of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Now, I did mention that religion was quite close to sales, but if we go slightly further, we notice that it tended to veer off into other topics. Uh, topics that were potentially quite political at the time. Um, who here, small show of virtual hands, has seen the HBO series Watchmen? Okay, so that's horrible because uh, I was going to use it as an example. But uh, okay, so the main context for Watchmen is alternate history. Yeah, uh, so the film is based on the same alternate history, so... At least we have some part of, uh, of uh, yeah, we'll be able to work off of that. Alternate history. 
where an event happens and instead of continuing in mo what we call now history and continuing in uh, the um, let's say continued oppression of uh, African Americans in the United States um, something else happened recognition happened and uh, something a government policy called redfordations which would ha were reparations by the state under President Redford in order to uh, let's say excuse or at least uh, pay off the debt of slavery and of the oppression of uh, African Americans uh, was enacted which you might notice is a bit different from our current situation uh, where retrodations are a thing that don't exist. But one of the things in the series that uh, I mentioned was the Tulsa Massacre. And this is something that happened in actual history as well. Uh, if you go back a while, uh, you may hear of a city in Oklahoma. Uh, I think it's called Greenview or Greenfield, one of those, that was considered as one of the greater, uh, more liberal, more prosperous cities in the Midwest. Uh, Oklahoma being the middle of semi-nowhere in the United States. And in that area, the uh, Ku Klux Klan, so a band of white extremists, decided to take it in their own hands to go to what was then called Black Wall Street and massacre a ton of people. Um, of course, African Americans. And there were a lot of deaths, a lot of injured. And it did affect, um, let's say, race relations in the United States for a long time. Uh, why am I talking about this? Beside the fact that it is part of, well, let's say the world history, because it did affect a lot of things. It is because documents relate to the fact that local government armed the, uh, the Ku Klux Klan members that went to then um, massacre all these people. Which, if you know the context of race relations in the United States those relations were quite severely axed on fear and uh, let's say the effect of uh, uh, the African-American community on the white community. And that's one of the more, let's say, violent examples of FUD out there. If you go a little bit further, just a tiny bit, 30 years into the future, maybe 40, the Cold War. Um, pits the USSR against mostly uh, the Western Bloc, mainly headed by the United States, and massive, uh, I'm not going to call them witch hunts, but commie hunts go on in the, in the United States. You have the Red Scare, um, where people start seeing communists in their soup and denouncing each other and doing all these kinds of horrible things to one another. Uh, mainly because they were all afraid of another, well, type of governance. And uh, they were sold by government, by propaganda, that war was almost imminent. That a lot of things were going to happen should um, the uh, communist lifestyle come to the United States. It, you know, long story short, it was another application of FUD that affected people, uh, normal people, like yourself or myself, um, just now they're old and possibly dead. And it generated a lot of, not backlash, but it set a lot of things backwards. Um, so yeah, a little bit further, Slightly, uh, slightly further, uh, have has anyone here heard of the Woodstock Festival? 
and I, I'm assuming this is going to have slightly more hands raised than, um, well, Black Wall Street. Okay, we have one yes. Maybe two, maybe three. I'm going to re-explain that anyways, but it'd be nice to... Okay, let's say that at least one third of the audience knows what the Woodstock Festival is. Woodstock Festival was a music festival, a multi-day festival, that put on stage a lot of not controversial artists, but artists that caused controversy among certain um, less tolerant individuals. Um, you may have heard the expression, rock and roll was is the music of the devil. Um, there was an incident at uh, Woodstock Festival, but let's not get into that one. Uh, one of the main things that was happening in the m music industry was the emergence of, uh, let's say, the cultural emergence uh, on every side of, uh, let's say, the racial divide of black artists, either Motown music, uh, so from the uh, Motown Records company uh, out of Detroit, uh, going blasting through the south of the United States, the very, you know, uh, still mostly segregationary south of the United States, and putting on music that was enjoyed by both and that could be attended by both the African Americans and uh, Caucasians. And this was source of other tensions. Go slightly in the future, and you have Woodstock. Uh, frontman Jimi Hendrix uh, performing... Uh, <laughs> You know, the, the national anthem on an electric guitar, blasting it, being a symbol of unity. And you have incidents, and the festival ends, and fantastic festival. I wasn't there, but, you know, I, I probably, I wasn't alive back then. But still, uh, recordings are fantastic, music is fantastic. Move slightly into the future, a few months, maybe a year or two, and Jimi Hendrix is this icon of music, icon of uh, unity, icon of rock and roll, starts doing some music, and at some point, before some interview, is found dead in his hotel in London. Apparent overdose on wine. A few months later, one of his entourage wants to talk about uh, Jimi Hendrix, ends up dead. A year later, his ex-girlfriend, well, his girlfriend, who, ex by death um ends up dead when she was slated to appear on tv discussing hendrix's suspicious death is this some policy trying to pressure the um american music industry or uh, and try to break down the um the, the, the tentative uh, attempt to unite uh the racial divide via music or is it just death and happenstance? No one knows. This is unsubstantiated. But you, a lot of tabloids were using this as an example of, um, hey, race relations in the U.S. are still not nice, which everyone knew. But uh, go slightly further into the future and also a little bit slightly into the past. The war on drugs. And um, controversial, I'll say congratulations to drugs for winning the war on drugs, at least the war of attrition where they literally went on a, on a rampage and criminalized every single form of drug out there. Like, um, if you would rape a woman, you would have a lesser sentence than if you were carrying around uh, a bit of weed and potentially selling it, And which just sounds ridiculous. That's still the case in some states. Don't mind. Uh, don't, don't think that's gone. It's, it's a little weird. And so, yeah, it's the, the war on drugs was really popularized. Like, oh, yes, what are you going to do? Are you going to smoke that joint? Or are you going to be a productive member of society? Propaganda, propaganda, propaganda. All the while selling as much alcohol as possible, because, of course, alcohol, uh, everyone knows, is healthy. This was sarcasm. Um, 
<clears throat> uh, because you could tax alcohol. You could tax tobacco. Same thing. But no, drugs, unregulated market, horrible. <sighs> All of these things are applications of FUD that don't have anything to do with cybersecurity. Now, one of the things that is going to bring us more into the modern age is that all of this can affect the stock market. Now, if you know of the U.S., is that the United States are a very capitalist country. And uh, I hear pe people saying, oh, duh. Yes. Um, the thing is that FUD can inflame political tensions, but can also inflame the stock market. For example, somewhat recently, all of the fear surrounding the pandemic uh, made it that the cost of the barrel of Brent, so petrol, right, uh, even though less things were moving around, still skyrocketed. Petrol is, or diesel, or, you know, gas, or uh, leadless fuel, costs more now than two years ago. Why? No one knows. People haven't been driving as much. Electric vehicles are coming on the market. Um, hell if I know why it's getting uh, more expensive. Um, quite recently, two, three days ago, uh, Meta, so the parent company of Facebook, uh, marks for the first time that they're losing users. Losing users sounds horrible, right? Um, out of 2 billion people, out of 8 billion people on the planet, well, 2.5 billion out of 8 billion people on the planet, they have a non-increase in the number of people logging in every day. Meta stock nosedives, 25% uh, wiped out. Uh, personal fortune of Zuckerberg, it pains me to say, sarcasm again, uh, lost a few billion dollars just because of investor fear. Which wasn't even motivated by another actor. It was just people being afraid of where their money is. Which sounds, you know, bonkers. But whatever. Now, if we go a little bit through, uh, well, back into the past, but into technology, well, a little bit more than Facebook, um, one of the more known, let's say, fudders around there was Microsoft. Uh, now, Microsoft is, let's see, one of the key drivers of, com well, of personal computing. Uh, they were in a war with IBM. They were in a war with Apple. They still are, more or less. Um, and they were some of the principal developers. Well, they were the principal developers behind MS-DOS. Okay. MS-DOS, quite nice. And... Another type of DOS, um, well, let's say operating system, was Dr. DOS. Software that was created by Microsoft to run on MS-DOS would, if run on uh, Dr. DOS uh, architecture, even though the, the application was perfectly compatible, throw out uh, what they call non-fatal errors to the user. It would literally say, non-fatal error, uh, please contact Windows 3.1 beta team. Uh, something, something, something. And the main driver behind this is that, yeah, don't use our competitors. Use MS-DOS. It's more stable. It won't throw out all these weird errors. Th this actually came out of an SEC investigation that was released like, 15, 20 years later. Um, they also waged war on the, uh, you know, FOSS community, uh, open source software, saying, hey, it infringes on patents, even though software patents weren't really a thing back then. Hardware patents either. Um, you, they, they, they mentioned, I think it was some ridiculous number, like 560 patents, and they were saying, like, hey, it's infringing on all these patents. You won't be able to use the software within X weeks, months, years, because uh, we're going to apply patent law. Um, now, that's a bit, you know, 
horrible on Microsoft's side, I'll admit. Um, uh, James asks, uh, is it really a war with Apple or more of a skirmish to keep them contained safely? I mean, Apple did computers for a long while, then kind of didn't and went into the smartphone market and iPod and, you know, wearables and all that jazz. And continued with its computers and iMacs and all that jazz. But if you look at the at the numbers of um, who is buying Apple and who is buying Microsoft and who is buying neither or just hardware to run Linux on, Apple still is in the minority share. So is it something about getting them contained safely? I mean, so long as hardware costs are so expensive and that the, let's say, expensive BSD layer that is not, uh, that you know I call Mac OS is still on it and still freaking expensive then I mean they're containing themselves pretty much uh, by just being inaccessible to most of the population um, so yeah uh, if we go slightly into the future there was um, that's when I mentioned Microsoft versus IBM yeah uh, Microsoft funded uh, what was the SCO group in a lawsuit, which was ideally meant to occupy um, uh, IBM, whilst Microsoft was free to continue its development of hardware, and also reduce trust in IBM hardware so that they wouldn't be used as much in, in, in industrial settings in order to potentially boost sales for Microsoft hardware. Um, if we go back to Apple very quickly, because, I mean, you know, hammer and nail. Um, Apple, uh, I think a sales manager or someone uh, at Apple men uh, said, uh, verbatim, jailbreaking, well, not verbatim, but uh, slightly amended. Uh, I'll get to that. Uh, jailbreaking phones can crash cell towers, which is slightly... I'd say more ridiculous, but also less ridiculous than Macs don't get vi viruses, which uh, uh, James just mentioned. Yes, someone said jailbreaking phones can crash cell towers, which just sounds ridiculous unless they really get into the very, uh, they manage to get control of the uh, communications layer and, s I don't know, buffer overflow a cell tower or DDoS a cell tower from a single phone. Which, I mean, sure, maybe, why not? No, probably not. Um, Max don't get viruses, also, yeah, common myth, um, which, you know, they've since retracted, but still persists in the, um, in the common psyche, uh, common, no, the, uh, yeah, the parlance, the psyche surrounding computing and uh, and Apple, um, and yeah, it's it's still there, and we still need to deal with it every day. So that's uh, slightly slide two. Let's uh, move on to modernity. Let's let's talk about more modern stuff. Uh, because hell, I've been talking about the last thirty years. 30 years ago. Let's be today. Today, how does FUD affect users? Well, uh, if you have been on a computer without an ad blocker or without any, you know, protections, let's say you're running Internet Explorer and go on any website um, and it redirects you and it says, your PC has a virus. Haha, <laughs> call tech support now. Tech support scams are very, very prevalent. What does tech support do? Well, it's tech. It, it is in in actuality nothing technical. It's a sales pitch. You have a problem with your computer, which is mainly that a web page is calling for attention every five seconds, or uh, a software that they've installed starts up ever randomly and maybe crashes your computer or whatever, and tells you to call a number. Or you Google something with the name of the program, and since they've done their bit of SEO, so search engine optimization, they are the first company that lands on the phone number. And let's say they're not, 
they also control the domains for all the other ones that mention this because you know you need to flood them uh, uh, the, the the search engines a bit so you pick up the phone you call the number and you're like uh, hi yeah my phone uh, uh, my computer is doing this and they're like oh yes uh, give us remote access and then potentially they'll uh, grab files on your computer or they'll potentially blackmail you or they'll tell you just to pay them to do it and then they'll delete one file and it'll be done um that's one of the more uh let's say um it is one of the fud techniques that will affect maybe not us but a lot of people close to us let's say our elders uh maybe children um you know people that aren't necessarily aware of risks or aware of how to shield themselves to protect themselves against risk. This is something that is going to affect them potentially uh, quite acutely. And the main tactic is the same thing as anywhere else. It's panic drives sales. Um, one of the other techniques would be enticement. Um... So you're using a software uh, commercially or something. You're know, like, um, oh, yes, to access this one weird feature we knew you uh, everyone would want, but we still put behind a paywall, needs the Alpha Pro Premium S Plus Enterprise License, which costs, I don't know, 5000 per user per week or something um, for that piece of software. Uh, clickbait. Top 10 home appliances you mistakenly thought were safe. Uh, where they just... You know, either it's a list that's paid by competitors on which they put, you know, the, the names of things of uh, a company's competitors. Like, let's say I'm um, Hamsung, to not name any companies. And um, uh, I produce fridges and uh, smart fridges, to be to be to be exact. And there is this other company called, I don't know, uh, uh, Beamens that uh, also produces fridges. We both produce smart fridges. And um, I'll pay, or I'll do it myself, and I'll build a list of unsafe home appliances. And I'll put their fridge on it without any validation, without anything else. And it's going to get referenced. It's going to be shared. I prom pay for a promoted tweet that's going to land on Atomic Nikos' feed because apparently Atomic Nikos likes top 10 lists. Sorry, this is me ranting at uh, Twitter's um, ad algorithm. I, I keep blocking their accounts and the same things show up. The exact same things, are just a different account promoting them. It's ridiculous. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Small tangent. Um, and it might drive their own sales. Who knows? Um, one of the more hated things, and uh, some people in the room may echo this, is vaporware. Um... So a company, let, let's go with uh, Beamens this time again, uh, says, uh, hey, we'll be releasing this um, new model of a smartphone. Uh, it has 32 gigabytes of RAM and uh, 16 gigabytes of VRAM and uh, NVIDIA Tesla cores on it. I don't know. Which, to be honest, nowadays would fit into a suitcase. But let's say they say that and uh, it's on a phone. Just to put the, um, the exaggeration into play. And this is a new product, a flagship product. Now, before that, just slightly before that, through some very crafty industrial espionage, our company, um, I, I don't know how I called it, uh, let's just call them Bambung or whatever, uh, finds out about this. And vaporware is basically going going to be bambung saying you know what our flag next flagship product which we've just thought out right now is going to have 128 gigabytes of ram and uh one terabyte hard drive i'm talking about a smartphone uh and uh, also um uh i don't know an octo core gpu that has a combined 64 gigabytes of vram i don't know anything just slightly better than, than the one that was announced. And the idea is that they announce it first. Even if there's no production, no planning, no nothing. And the idea is just to detract from uh, engagement on the future project. Uh, the future product, right? 
And they'll just be saying, hey, we're doing this too. You don't need to be excited about what they're doing. We announced it first. There's that. Uh, they're stealing the thunder, quite literally. Uh, one of the other things is the sense of urgency. Uh, have you ever been, and um, I'll ask for a show of hands again, on a sales website? Let's say, not Amazon, but um, something more, um, let's say Etsy or eBay or uh, Vinted, possibly, or uh, Airbnb or I don't know, whatever. Has anyone used one of those websites recently and don't doesn't have an ad blocker? I do have to mention that. Feel free to use no mic to type your answer. I'm going to assume that most people here use an ad blocker. Right, I'm peeping no response. So I'll just go and say that have you seen the uh, sentence pop up on one of those websites going, 13 other customers are looking at this product right now. And 13 is not bold, and uh, you have a timer and all that stuff, and it's all ticking down. And um, if you look slightly into the source code, it's just popping out a random number, right? Uh, because who has the analytics power when you're a small platform to, or a very big platform with a lot of products to track everything and do it in real time? No, it's a random number. Um, the sense of urgency, which I mentioned earlier, panic, right? Uh, a sense of urgency that you're in need of a product and you found the semi-ideal product or something that you were looking for. It's like 13 other people are looking at this product. Buy it now. Buy it fast. Um, uh, same sense of things. Black Friday. Yeah. Uh, so as James mentioned, principles of influence number six. Scarcity. Or scarcity. I don't know. Either pronunciation is fine, I guess. Um, for me. Um, yeah going like uh, during Black Friday uh, we have 200 products available it might be actually 200 products available but what they'll do is they'll be like oh look at this very reduced price it's minus 25% that's a that's an interesting very attractive deal right if you would look at the same product like I don't know five weeks earlier it would have cost 25% less but they drive up the prices in order to then drive them down and say that they drove them down. So uh, Basano mentioned that Chinese websites do that a lot. Yeah, uh, Ali, I could have mentioned AliExpress. That, or, uh, what was it? DBGate? DHgate? I don't know, one of them. Um, they do that a lot. Uh, in terms of software, uh, or let's say uh, you're using some form of corporate or enterprise software at, I don't know, at Company X, and uh, you're looking to change to another uh, type of software. Uh, let's say it's an ERP, so an uh, Enterprise Resource uh, Program, I think. Yeah. Uh, so something in order to manage uh, inventories, perform connections, all that jazz. And you have a semi-integrated system, but it's missing that little one thing. And you're looking at a competitor to maybe change because let's be honest the software hasn't been updated since 1995 and it has a crap GUI and uh, all your users are com well com users or employees are complaining that uh, if you press the button slightly to the left on an HD monitor the, the application crashes and it takes five minutes to boot up or something I don't know and sales people go like yeah, yeah we'll study the question and then they'll call both and try to do a plus and a minus and the people that you're currently with are going to be like, why are they asking us these things again? I thought we had them as a client. And then they'll press and then, you know, all that jazz happens. And we'll be like, uh, why would you get uh, X company software when uh, uh, when it doesn't do what uh, our software, uh, you know, uh, does? Which is they're probably one flagship thing that it does very well. Um, and, you know, you need to put the, for, uh, you know, embrace the pros embrace the cons and kind of, you know, do your math. And if you're not an end user, you might be doing the math on data you don't have or on assumptions. And that's one of the other things that salespeople try to drive into. Uh, working off of biases, working off of, of assumptions, working off of incomplete data on the part of the um, person that wants, you know, to buy this. 
So, moving on. Let's talk about FUD and cybersecurity. And I messed that transition up. Um, yeah, we work in cybersecurity, and fear, uncertainty, and doubt is one of the not key drivers of how people interact with cybersecurity, at least not within the industry. But it's one of the uh, key drivers of people uh, interacting with the industry from an outside perspective. Um, example. Uh, nation state X is attacking our infrastructure. Um, Log4j is the worst apocalypse level vulnerability we've ever seen. Um, uh, it's all techniques where big words are used on an unsuspecting public going, uh, hey, you know, we've identified this. And it's used to drive engagement, used to drive... Uh, product sales, potentially, if you're, let's say, an ERP vendor or a uh, managed security services vendor, one of the less ethical ones. Um, it's used to coerce actors, uh, potentially people that are reporters, people that are, that have reach, that can communicate uh, potentially false data to more people uh, than you could. Uh, it's used to fuel dissent. You could potentially start a revolution just by saying the correct words. Uh, if anyone has seen Person of Interest any time, uh, there's this one scene where a fixer goes, um, yeah, uh, one time I was um, in a bad situation and my parents were being accused of whatever, and uh, this one person went up to the reporters and said two words and they all left. Uh, because you can fuel dissent the same way that you can fuel other things. You can build stories out of the outside of reality, but that sound real enough to someone that might not be initiated, or even those that are initiated, but that are not necessarily in the know. Uh, one of the key drivers of fun, not not on purpose, they they don't communicate about it that much, but it's one of the key uh, excuses or one of the key um, well, let, drivers of communication about the topic are APTs, Advanced Persistent Threats. Why? Not because they're saying, hey, we'll hack your country and blow you up and political reason A or B, but just because they'll you know, do something, paralyze some form of infrastructure, paralyze a hospital, paralyze something, ask for money, and be the overall bad guys. That's why we call them threats. Now, of course, we're calling them threats, but we're only mapping the ones that act in our disinterest. That's political bias, usually. Um, if we if we talk about things that have happened, uh, hospitals have been ransomware. Uh, Ryuk was two years ago, well, one and a half years ago, so during a pandemic, right? Ransomware in hospitals during a pandemic. Really class thing. Uh, Ryuk was used to against two hospitals in France, paralyzing them. Um, key infrastructure, such as the Colonial Pipeline, was attacked and ransomed. Uh, it was allegedly the Dark Side group, so an Eastern European, uh, um, well, ransomware gang. And instead of paying for a while, they... The colonial pipeline just shut down uh, instead of operating and you know serving actual people that might have been in need of fuel they shut down operations and at some point they paid and then an investigation happened arrests happened got reimbursed i don't know if arrests happened in this case but they got reimbursed because the money was found somehow but um yeah a company that was under attack chose to uh be a disservice to the people who is supposed to help. Okay, that's not genial, but it is an attack on key infrastructure. Uh, the very spoken about solar winds problem, uh, where the solar winds Orion platform uh, was allegedly, well, not allegedly, but was backdoored, um, you know, uh, backdoored that was then access to potentially infiltrate 18,000 customers uh, in one of the 
bigger supply chain attacks that was found. Uh, well, that has happened, or at least that we're aware of in recent history. Um, now, this is cyber. Okay, cyber is nice. Uh, infrastructure. We live in, let's say, more of a digital cyber world. Our infrastructure lives in the physical world. Um, Nashville, 2020. And AT&T, um, let's say, routing center. Not exactly routing center. Uh, an AT&T uh, station where data was routed through in Nashville was bombed. Apparently not for any type of um, reason that was relating to the fact that it was a key point of infrastructure, but more because it's a um, nice center of the city point to put a bomb. Um, it wasn't an RV. Lonely person decided to make a statement and die with their bomb. Uh, it was an AT&T network facility. Problem is, it was also mostly of a single point of failure for a large area. Which meant a lot of people weren't able to use their phones or internet for a short while. Which kind of puts things into perspective. And yeah, that can be used to uh, either drive politicians to say, hey, maybe we should invest into infrastructure. Or then do the most, um, well, non... Let's say the thing that they didn't do, which is just repair the thing and move on. Um... No political commentary will be given on this issue at this time, uh, but you all know what I think. <sighs> Moving on. Um, echo chambers and sensationalism. Uh, this is... Well, if you've been on Twitter um, the last few... Well, the last week, you'll know what I'm talking about. I'm not going to mention any names because uh, this is not the point. Um, sensationalism is... A key, not a key, um, byproduct of what we work in. You find a fantastic, very easy to exploit uh, bug, let's say log4j, and people get aware of it. Ma mainly because it's affecting them, or because some streamer showed it on, on Twitch because they were using it against their friends on Minecraft because they read about it in some kind of obscure forum. And you get a lot of excitement, but not excitement on the sense of people that uh, know how to react to it or uh, know that they're vulnerable or not. Just excitement on the sense of, ooh, it's taking down things and we can see it and oh my god, someone's done it, and uh, ooh, it can affect Minecraft servers, and ooh, people are saying that it can affect more things. Yes, um, James, uh, Poodle, Meltdown, Spectre, yes. Uh, I'm saying Log4j because it happened recently, and a lot of people are still pissed out, uh, pissed about it, and um, as Gary, who's not here, um, mentioned sometime in chat, uh, <laughs> Yeah, people are still asking about how to remediate against Log4j, which slightly less, well, slightly more annoying in the current context than Spectre because, well, let's be honest, it didn't make as much as a volume of noise. It did a shit ton of noise. But Attack a Child's game, do a lot of shit, and even though it wasn't exploited that much, relatively speaking, it did a ton of noise. And a lot of people were panicking everywhere, all the time. Like, oh, it's the worst thing we've ever seen. Um, and within two or three days, oh yeah, update to 2.17, I think it was. And um, that'll fix everything. A day later, oh damn it, we're still vulnerable because there's this alternate way of uh, crafting LDAP query, you know, queries. And you're like, okay? Or no, GNUI requests, sorry. Um, okay, still panicking, still panicking, it's still bad. Um, remediation, haha, <laughs> we found a remediation. And you're like, okay, that's cool. But the problem is the cycle of, ah, is already ongoing. Everyone's still yelling, everyone's still scared. And, yeah, a lot of people were like, oh, this vulnerability is an apocalypse level problem, haha. <laughs> um, 
Another thing that did a lot of noise that wasn't really related to cybersecurity, but still uh, had a lot of people thinking, ooh, it might be a cyber attack, ooh, a DDoS, or an infrastructure thing in a jig. Facebook's BGP outage. Um, uh, yeah, Facebook's BGP outage. Uh, that, you know, was a misconfiguration. <laughs> Just, you know, you, you're there, you're... You, you're on, you know, the internet and you're on Facebook and suddenly you can't access Facebook.com anymore. You can't access um, Instagram. Everything is down. The main tool you use to communicate with the world is down. You know, during a pandemic. Fantastic, right? And uh, is it a cyber attack? Has Facebook been deleted off the face of the earth? Yeah, WhatsApp as well. Uh, people panicking because they can't call their family to tell them that something is wrong because they can't access Facebook. And then relying on TikTok or Snapchat or whatever. I don't know. Um, or Telegram or Signal. You know, one of the slightly nicer ones. <clears throat> or Keybase. Or Wire. Or Riot. Or Element. The list goes on. You get the point. Um, and they can't communicate. And it freezes everything. And people are scared. And... and uh, it turns out it was just a misconfiguration that replicated wildly uh, across, you know, Facebook's infrastructure. Which, when you look at it, it's just frigging, well, not hilarious. Well, it is hilarious that you don't have, I don't know, controls that can detect us and that wasn't considered as a threat because, let's be honest, it wasn't exactly a threat. If you do things correctly and, you know, do things safely it shouldn't happen shouldn't being the operate uh, operative word but it happened and accident or not it threw half of the world in panic or at least the 2.4 billion people that use facebook um uh, you have something that is a source of speculation uh you have reporters saying haha from our sources quoted or unquoted um, uh, say that um, this vulnerability was exploited or it was a very simple uh, kind of Excel table this is something I read in some article it was badly translated but still in a kind of Excel table that tells the internet where Facebook is semi-verbatim um, that went wrong which technically if you remove Excel and the fact that it's one table is somewhat true. Oops. It's not exactly true, but it's sufficiently true to communicate it to a less tax, a tech savvy, um, pe you know, group. And saying that, oh, a fix is on the way. When, when you've just said this, it's just, it's just an Excel table problem. A fix is on the way. They, they found a backup, something. You know, it's it's enough to reassure people. Fantastic. Reporters should do their due diligence when, when communicating this. Because, and this is where we get into the uh, echo chambers part of this title, when you say something and it's, let's say, sensational and it drives fear, people are going to echo it. Might be, people, uh, might be people in the know, might be people, um, you know, just echoing it because it's newsworthy, might be people just uh, that like you and will just signal boost you or something. Okay. It's reporters doing their due diligence is fantastic. Uh, if they manage to communicate a very technical topic to a less technical audience, fantastic. Even if they fudge the technical terms a lot and, like, do a few shortcuts, it's fantastic. So long as you get people to not necessarily tell them that the world is going to end and that things are getting better. Uh, it's not fixed, but it's getting there. You'll be fine. Um, <clears throat> this is where we get into the recent uh, events. Cat, uh, well, period, and uh, no names, uh, of course. Um, 
I'll be echoing what another channel said, uh, Studio Psych. Check them out. They produce content, uh, good content. Um, said that sometimes mistakes happen. You say something and it's wrong. Um, you're a reporter and you, I don't know, reported something incorrect. Um, not necessarily knowingly, uh, not necessarily out of malice, but it got echoed. And it made headlines and it was sensational and all that. And people are, you know, scared. Uh, something was misrepresented and, um, you know, an issue could not have been forwarded or described accurately enough to reduce panic or uh, could not have been disclosed correctly. Like if I find a vulnerability, uh, let's say I'm, I don't know, doing whatever, I find a vulnerability in, what's, what's a random bank? Let's not use a bank. Uh, in ABC Bank, which is, you know, a CTF name for a bank. Haha, <laughs> CTFs are useful for this uh, type of sources. So ABC Bank is um, has a vulnerability. It allows me to, I don't know, steal everyone's money and launder it. And, I don't know, build a life of crime in a, a criminal drug empire or something. I don't know. Who knows? And I, the first thing I do when I find this is, hey, Twitter, I found a massive vulnerability in ABC Bank. Um, I've stolen everyone's money, or I can steal everyone's money. Well, <laughs> um, you're going to cause panic, first of all, with the customers of ABC Bank, then with management of ABC Bank, um security team of ABC Bank was already more or less in in the, the circles where this would have been said. So they're sweating bullets. And everyone is having a bad time. Uh, this was the same thing that happened with Log4j. What happened with Log4j? Who was thrown under the bus? People that were using Log4j? No, they, they couldn't do anything with, uh, for it. They were probably getting yelled at by managers, but they couldn't do much about it. No, developers were thrown under a bus. People that spend their free time developing a piece of software that's used by millions of projects along the world, uh, well, around the world, are thrown under the bus and say, said, ooh, how could you do this and not make this an opt-in thing? Once, you know, they'd find out what was the problem. Um, and, yeah, it's... that sad. But let's say you disclosed it incorrectly, and it was somewhat malicious, okay, then, then it's bad. Uh, <laughs> you have that big gap between something that is um, accidentally misrepresented, either through inco incompetence, either through a, a lack of contextual knowledge, let's put it that way, uh, not exactly ignorance, but close, and you know, you have that going on. And it's, you also have potentially malice, something malicious going on, uh, people that are going to echo it for malicious purposes. All of this is kind of horrible when you think about it. And this is where we get into the sensationalism part again, is that if you look at how things get propagated, information gets propagated, uh, you'll notice that several actors have different motives. And these motives could very well be spread out on a DND alignment chart. So you could just put these things into all these categories. And, um, some things that are good, uh, people just wanting to help. Okay, that's neutral good. Uh, helping people remediate and fix and uh, protect and heal and, you know, let's say application security teams, blue teams, SOC teams. Those would be more in the lawful good. And then you have your vulnerability disclosures, people that uh, scan the internet. Uh, uh, for example, uh, Leonard uh, works at David Day as a Dutch Institute for Vulnerability Disclosure. So Leonard is one of the people on the server, right? Um, and he's a volunteer there, and he one of their projects is scanning the internet and finding vulnerabilities and disclosing them to the companies responsibly. 
and he, he's done an entire talk on how to disclose these things responsibly. Uh, I think it was BeerCon 2. A fantastic talk. Go, go look at it after this or whenever you want. Or if you're looking at a recording, I'll probably be linking it somewhere. Um, that would more be chaotic good. It's still good. Um, some people are going to do things slightly for more neutral reasons. Uh, they want to be recognized. They want to have some of the fame, some of the money. It's not exactly bad. It's not a bad motive. Wanting to uh, get out of a financially complicated situation is not a bad motive. Wanting to have some recognition is not a bad motive. How you do that is another story. Um, and then you have bad uh, motives. Uh, so you have, uh, instead of responsible disclosure, you have irresponsible disclosure. Like the case I mentioned of people just saying, hey, Twitter, um, on Twitter, ABC Bank is wholly vulnerable to something. That would be chaotic bad, probably. Bug bounties. Uh, people, instead of submitting a vulnerability, uh, like a bug bounty, go like uh, sending an email. Hey, I found a CSRF issue in your, um, uh, in your web application. Give me money. And uh, I'll tell you where it is. That's a bank bounty. That would be lawful evil. Lawful bad. Uh, incendiary reactions uh, to someone being called out on bad research. Chaotic bad. Uh, you know, it's, the ND alignment charts are fantastic for a lot of things. So that's a bit more about echo chambers. What about what we can do against echo chambers, against um, fueling all of this, you know, all of these horrible reactions and few, uh, against all of the FUD that's going on. Well, <sighs> once again, mapping back to uh, the drama that was happening, peer reviewing things is important. If people, multiple people from the same industry corroborate some form of vulnerability and corroborate that some people are vulnerable and they do it uh, not exactly hush hush but they do it correctly they uh, they talk about it to the company the company uh, probably resolves it or needs their help to resolve to identify what the problem is etc and all of this gets done and one of the people the first person that found it gets recognition okay fine it's been peer-reviewed, it's been disclosed, it's been remediated, no one's exactly panicked. A few uh, weeks later, it pops up in the news, hey, this thing was vulnerable, but fear not. It was resolved before anyone noticed. Which may or may not be a lie. Uh, the person, it could have been popped before, no one would know, or potentially someone would know, if they had sufficient auditing skills. Okay. Um, if your company is a vulnerability disclosure program, I mentioned that earlier, or a security.md file at the root uh, directory of, uh, you know, of your web app or something. That's a fantastic practice. You're telling people exactly where to go and who to contact to fix something. Brilliant. Or if you're working with one of the bug bounty platforms, um, I'll cite Eurocopter, uh, Hacker One, etc., etc., um, you could potentially make some money off of it. No one is blaming you for wanting to make money off of um, honest work. You know, honest work you know, needs an honest pay. <laughs> and if you're doing it correctly, then everything is fine. If you manage to promote some form of security awareness, um, and th th this is with the small addenda that, um, you know, uh, Gary mentioned last week, that 15% uh, of all security awareness is actually effective. Even if those 15% are, are the only effective percent of security awareness training, you're still getting some people to be able to react differently. Um, from my time at uni, which is still now, but I'm talking about antecedent classes, uh, one of the things that was said was hackers uh, are problematic for your company they they, they they they're horrible people they will trash all your systems uh, uh, um, they'll make your ipod only play jethro at all uh, if you don't know the reference this is a weird al reference uh, to a song called virus alert um which i mean i'll link again um yeah it's 
Where was it? Yeah. So the these management classes um, are saying this to students, people who will potentially become managers afterwards, uh, provided they, you know, succeed and et cetera, and get a manager position, et cetera. Um, and these people were told that hackers are bad. Now, me being a hacker, I don't know, uh, found a vulnerability, contacted them via their non-existent security MD. So I just took the first email that I found, probably by someone in my network on LinkedIn, and was like, hey, I'm a hacker, and I found a vulnerability. And um, this is it. If you've been told that hackers are bad, you might go totally off base and um, fudge everything up and, I don't know, start threatening legal action, etc., 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 and uh, elevate it badly and misrepresent it among uh, other people of the company, etc., etc. And that's a problem. If, however, people are aware that these programs exist and that people might contact them, if they didn't find the security MD or something of the sort, then you don't get these kinds of incidents. You get peaceful resolutions. You get, you remove the panic element. You remove the fear element. And then the uncertainty element that comes from, you know, is this person legit? Is this person threatening me? Is this person uh, being a threat to my company, etc., etc. And you're removing all these facets of doubt. And even if only 15% at a time get to a state where they're slightly more aware about security, it's better than zero. And that's something to be said for that. Uh, if you're working in a hospital, and uh, I mentioned earlier the case where the French, um, well, two French hospitals got ransomware via, you know, with uh, the Ryuk ransomware. Um, a third hospital was on the firing line, let's put it. And when they heard that the first two hospitals got hit, the first thing they did was they disconnected everything from the network before being infected. And they had a remedi uh, not a remediation procedure, but uh, not exactly an incident response uh, procedure. But they, uh, someone had modeled the threat and had said, hey, if something happens, here's a plan. And this is what you need to disconnect from the network. And they were not hit by ransomware. And at, after that, um, a ransomware incident got fixed at the to, uh, to other hospitals and things could start up again. I, I did mention it was during, in the middle of a pandemic, which, you know, dick move, everyone. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah. And then there's uh, the uh, part where we need to avoid fueling the flames. And this is circling fully back to what happened this week. And uh, no names, once more. But by engaging with um, sensationalist or bad content, you feed it into the algorithm by saying you suck or uh, this is wrong and driving engagement on one of your tweets even if you did it in the uh, best possible sentiment for the you are wrong and this is why uh, you might actually be bringing the thing to the attention of more people and these people might not necessarily respect you as much as the other person. And they might pile on on you. They might pile on on them without necessarily being in the know or. Uh... OK, sorry about that. Um, Tabasco bottle laying around. It's perfectly normal in a work environment. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, you're fueling an incendiary take and it's problematic. Um, and just by interacting with it, by liking it, by retweeting, by um, pressing the celebrate button on LinkedIn, whatever that is useful for, by reacting it with the uh, laughing out loud emoji, well, the raffle emoji on uh, Facebook, you're feeding the reactionary content or the sensationalist content into the algorithm. Meaning that even if yourself are aware that it is bad content, the people that it is going to reach either by it being uh, promoted or anything else, 
can be less aware of this situation than you are. And in the worst case scenario, it could be picked up by a news outlet and it could be uh, misrepresented by a news outlet and remain on said news outlets, um, I don't know, news page for a full day before being uh, redacted and then finally retracted because there was one a lack of due diligence on the reporter's part but there was also and you know the, the whole reporter part is also the part of you know log4j devs being piled up on shouldn't necessarily pile up on the um, on the reporter they did their job they just didn't do it correctly um yeah it's if they're wrong and they make an addenda or an errata and mention that it was a mistake it can help but by engaging with it and saying, hey, it's wrong, you're not giving credence, but you're putting it in the scope of other people's um, feeds. And other people might interact with it and not know about that. <sighs> so, yeah. If it happens to you and you make a mistake and, you know, you've made a mistake and people tell you you've made a mistake, um, the best course of action is just saying, Oh, right. I, I see that I've made a mistake. In worst case, you say, no, I'm right. And, you know, you have your, your own bias and you, 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 you're all, uh, you're wrong and you know, all that stuff. And uh, worst case scenario, a few more people will just pi uh, not pile on, but tell you you've made a mistake. If you have any level of self-awareness, you might check it out. And if you have no self-awareness at all, and I don't know, you're doing it for the cloud or something. It will just be like, no, everyone else is wrong, and everyone that's telling me I'm wrong has no credentials in the matter, and I'll be, um, I'll be suing all uh, each and one of you for libel if you've uh, written a blog post saying how that wrong this is. Which <clears throat> is the drama that happened this week, um, just amended for courteousness. <sighs> so yeah. Avoiding fanning the flames of FUD is problematic. It's hard in our industry because we want to be right and we want other people that are wrong to um, <clears throat> get their wrongs out of our face. That's semi-human. That's yeah, It is actually more or less human how we interact with the world. And yeah, it's, it's work. It's, it's a form of ethics and of work on oneself to be able to recognize it and to work uh, in such an environment that you don't do these kinds of mistakes. Um, and that if you do these kinds of mistakes, you can amend them and apologize and hopefully you will get over it and your rep reputation doesn't take a hit and everyone's happy at the end. Ideal um, fairy tale stories. Which brings us to the last part. We are an industry, uh, cybersecurity is an industry that you could say, if you were thinking of consulting work and of companies and all that, that it is a, an industry of professionals. I disagree. It's not an industry of professionals. Uh, it's not an industry for professionals either. A lot of people that do bug bounty, that do vulnerability disclosures are not professionals in any way. Um, they might be experts, they might have expertise, but they might not be professionals in the, in the sense of the term that you are employed by a company as a professional, which is just jargon, of course. But I mean, yeah, don't go calling someone a professional if they are an expert. And if someone calls themselves an expert, run away. Um, I mean, unless they're doing it satirically, such as myself, where I call myself an expert rookie. That's satire. Uh, so yeah, it's not an industry for professionals either. A lot of people that are non-professional are in this industry, and it's perfect. It keeps the blood, uh, well, the new blood flowing, which is very nice. It's an industry that contains professionals. It's an industry with professionals. Um, you might interact with a professional every day of your life, uh, whether they're a sysadmin, whether they're, um, I don't know, a consultant, whether they... Uh, talk to you on the server on a discord chat every day and they interact and they say hey this is nice and oh what have you done with your day or um, 
hi, smiley face, um, RP heart emoji. How are you doing? Um, or all those kinds of things. We're in an industry that contains a number of professionals. It contains CTF players. It contains people uh, doing vulnerability disclosures. It contains people just vibing. Contains engineers. It contains sysadmins. It contains uh, rookies of all creeds. It contains also, and I have to say this, it contains also bad people, bad actors. Um, some people within the industry may very well be racist, may be gatekeepery, may be uh, massive assholes. And I'm not saying we should accept this. Of course not. This is ridiculous. But they are a part of the industry. And even though you can try to shun them and remove them from the spaces you inhabit in the industry, if you have that power, or removing your ability to interact with them by blocking them, by removing their content from your feed, they are there until they're suddenly not. There was this one IT professional semi-security consultant person thingy uh, out of Canada. Very, very well not known, but not liked, but uh, at least they had interactions on Twitter and a lot of them turned out to be a child molester. This is bad. This is extremely bad. Um, but it shouldn't reflect on the industry. Um, there was a post by Gary uh, Hawkins uh, today um, that mentioned very specifically that cybersecurity is not a lifestyle. It's something we do. It's something we are paid, sometimes, to do. It's something where we might train for it. Uh, as a pen tester, you might train in the usage of certain tools. You might train to get a certification. But it's not your life. It's something you do to live your life. It's something you do to get paid to be able to do other things with your life. Uh, at some point, you'll potentially go and, you know, be old and not have to work anymore. Uh, you know, you might be at the age of uh, retirement. And if you've lived cybersecurity instead of just working in it and live your life, you'll have spent your life being miserable. So, yeah, uh, it's an industry with professionals. And these professionals might or might not be living their life as uh, in cybersecurity. I just contend that we should live our lives and do cybersecurity on the side. And treat it as a 9-to-5 occupation if we want to. And that it's healthier. And you know, I, of course, disregard this advice in all shapes, ways, and forms. And do a ton of community stuff on the side. But... Um, I'm trying to get better at it and doing more community focused and less cybersecurity focused stuff. So I know my faults. I know I'm saying these faults semi. Uh, uh, it's not hyper. Well, it's a bit hypercritically, but they're there and we need to not have cybersecurity be our entire lifestyle because it's. It leads to people living and breathing it and being attacked when they're told they're wrong in it breaks everything and people are unhappy and just massively problematic overall because it is a gatekeepery industry it is a toxic industry it is an industry where people are going to insult each other uh instead of hello and some people are nice some people are object assholes and that's the reality of every field but it is a reality in cybersecurity, and yeah that kind of concludes the present the, this I guess we can open this up to a discussion. Does anyone want to say anything? Does anyone think I'm wrong? Does anyone want to call me an asshole? 